good morning. So good to see you in the room. For those joining us online, we're so glad that you've joined us as well. Thank you for taking part of your Labor Day weekend to come and uh, to be part of what God is doing here. Uh, we believe God wants to do something special in your life, and we are so glad you're here. I wanted to mention a couple of things. Um, I want to reiterate what was said on the screen about um, our launches. Like right now, we know there's several things that are launching this Wednesday. Um, we are excited because we are joining as a network with other churches across our city to be a net for those who are struggling with hurts, habits, and hangups, those who are battling addiction. And uh, we are thrilled to be able to do that here at Sioux Falls First in Freedom Ministries. Um, it'll be at 6 o'clock. And uh, for those that come, there'll be child care for those in recovery, uh, those who are part of that. Um, at 6 o'clock, they'll do big group, then they'll go into men's group, women's group. And then they will come and join us at 7 o'clock right here in our counter worship service. And I'm excited because this week um, we get to hear from um, our brother Ulysses. He's actually going to be leading us in worship. And uh, he's going to be leading us predominantly in English. Um, but I said, dude, you got to bring some Spanish as well. And uh, brought up our Saturday night Spanish service uh, to, to participate in that. So we are excited about kicking off this week um, Encounter, our, our worship service, which again is going to be a family service. Generations coming together, cultures coming together. Um, we're going to try to relate to all the ages. And we are looking forward uh, to what God is going to do starting this Wednesday night. Now, I don't have to... Uh, tell you this, but you understand that we are living in a time of tremendous turmoil in our nation. Uh, we know that obviously election season, we know the political, the racial, COVID, um, kids going back to the classrooms and then being sent home. So many things are happening on a national, even global level. And um, I felt like the Lord spoke to me last week that so many times the church wants to fight spiritual battles with worldly weapons. And the Lord challenged me that we, we need to participate as a church in a season of prayer and fasting for national healing. And I have hope for America. I haven't lost that. But I understand the only way that healing is gonna come is when we submit our hearts humbly to God, we turn from our wickedness, we call on His name, and we come under the banner of the kingdom of God and say, God, we need you. And we are not picking up natural weapons. We are picking up the spiritual weapons that you've given us. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to pull down the strongholds. And so um, at the end of the month, I know Franklin Graham is, is uh, participating in a, a Saturday uh, prayer march for our nation. On that Saturday is when we are going to start our time, 21 days of prayer and fasting calling on God, and I believe God is going to respond. I believe we're faithful to pray. I believe God will be faithful to answer. And I believe God's going to help us navigate through these next few months and even years as we trust Him, as we put our faith in Him. So I'm inviting you to be part of that, um, whether it's Daniel fast, whether it's, you know, sporadic fasting with, with praying every day. Uh, I, I would love to see everybody involved in some way, some capacity, as we seek the Lord together as a church for those 21 days and even beyond that. So thank you for that. Thank you for making that a priority. And I just wanna say at the end of service today, um, if you're uh, watching online, I encourage you to get some bread and some juice. We are going to be participating in communion together and we want you to be part of that even though you're at home or maybe in a car somewhere um, in, on vacation. We want you to be part of that. And uh, you're gonna be very excited in the house to notice that we picked up different kind of communion packages. In fact, um, I, I, almost, I almost broke out in laughing today because um, I'll be honest with you, I told the, the huddle this morning before first service, I said, I'm so grateful for these because um, last time we did communion, I was batting 30, 33%. Like I only opened my communion package one service because I couldn't get it open the others. And uh, some of you probably didn't even, weren't even, even able to take communion because you couldn't get it open. It uh, wasn't kid proof, it's adult proof. So we got new ones. We thank God for our staff that called around and they got these. And uh, literally, you wanna make sure you open the cracker side first, right? You open the cracker, you eat that, and then you turn it over and you open the other side and it's real easy. 
And, uh, but at the end of the service, we're gonna, we're gonna celebrate uh, communion together. So if you have your Bibles or devices, would you go ahead and turn to the book of Acts chapter six. And then we're just gonna pray and ask the Lord to speak to us as we close out our Heart for the House series today. So Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for what you are doing already in this house. We sense your presence. We sense, Lord God, you moving. We know you're not just moving here. We know you're moving, Lord, in living rooms and in backyards and wherever people are gathering to even join us online. We pray that your Holy Spirit, God, would just continue to speak to hearts. Father God, I thank you for what you're doing across this building. I thank you, Father, that lives, young children, Lord, our little people are being invested in. God, the word of God is being deposited in them. And we know they're being transformed because of what is being shared with them as well, Father. God, we thank you for those, God, that will even watch later. I thank you, Father, that you're going to speak today. God, we, we tune in, we press into you, we open our ears, and we say, Holy Spirit, speak to us today. God, we love you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, and everybody shout it, amen. Amen, amen. amen. So one of the things we understand that we're gonna be praying for as well in our time of prayer and fasting is for the many small businesses and restaurants that are climbing back during this COVID season. We know it's hit a lot of people hard, a lot of business owners, and, and part of our prayer is we are praying that God would help them get back on their feet. God would help them recover from this time of difficulty, this season of COVID that they've experienced. And so with that being said, uh, the, the scenario that I'm gonna portray to you today is pre-COVID. It's not during, it's pre-COVID. But have you ever had a negative experience in a restaurant? Anybody? Anybody? Raise your hand. Yeah, I'm not alone, right? Well, I want you to imagine you hear about this brand new restaurant that everybody's bragging about and you're thinking, man, I wanna take my family. So one Friday night, you get your family already dressed up, ready to go. You've not eaten all day long because you are ready to go to this restaurant and eat and, and you're trying to watch your calories a little bit anyway, so you're picking this one meal, right? And so um, you, you, you get to the restaurant, uh, you walk through the doors and you quickly notice that there are only two waitresses and this restaurant is fairly packed. So finally, somebody, the host comes and, and uh, takes you to your seat and uh, you wait about 10 minutes and finally, water is placed on your table and you get a menu. And so you realize what's happening. So as the great leader you are, you look over to your family and say, hey, when they order, when they ask for a drink order, you give your food order. So you better hurry now. You better focus and pay attention because when they come, you, you can tell that, that, uh, that things are, are, are pretty tight there and, and we're, gonna, we're gonna do our order. And so um, probably another 20 minutes later, this poor waitress that's running all over the place and trying to serve everybody and try to take everybody comes up to you. You can tell that she's just exhausted and frustrated and she said, okay, I'll take your drink order. You said, no, we'll go ahead and give our food order as well. We picked. So you, you give your order and, um, and you see her, man, she's just running all over the place. I mean, you're, you're feeling for her, but, but it's been so long now, you've not got your food yet and you're getting a little frustrated. And not only are your kids hungry, they've transitioned into hangry. How many know what I'm talking about? And they're fussing and they're mad and they're punching each other. And uh, you're trying to settle them down. And in the midst of your frustration, not at the waitress, but at the setting, the lack of help, you say to your spouse, we are never coming back here again. The waitress feels so bad, finally she comes and delivers the food and she's apologizing and you're telling her not to worry about it. But you know what? The, the literal lack of service solidified your decision to never return. Now, all of us are familiar with experiences like that at some time in our lives, in some city, some restaurant, somewhere. But this morning, I want us to transfer that experience to Sunday morning, to somebody who's walking into 
the church for the very first time. They heard about their church, that friends invited them, they reached out to them, and finally they make a decision. In fact, most of them are probably at difficult seasons in their lives, and they're searching, and they're looking, and yet when they walk through the doors of the building, no one was there to greet them. So they walk through the doors, and, and they really don't know where they're going. There's no one to help them get their kids checked in. No one is there to help them get their kids to the nursery or to preschool or to kids' church. They walk up and think, well, maybe we can redeem this one. So they go up to the cafe. And, and, and the line's so long, and, and, and the experience is so jostled because there's not enough people serving that as they're waiting for their latte, that literally the worship service is almost over. So when they walk in, they awkwardly walk in late and take their seat just in time to hear the message. Now, at the end of service, they heard that they go to the next steps area and they can receive a gift and they can ask questions that they still have because they didn't get any help in the beginning. And they go there and no one is there to serve them. So finally, the man looks over at his wife and he says, you know, I don't, I don't feel at home here. We're never coming back here again. And you know, the, 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 the tragedy of that is that many of the people that we are investing in relationally, that we are inviting, that we're sharing our story with and asking them to come and, and take a seat with us at church and come to church with us and hey, there's a family there that is waiting for you Many of them are not even followers of Jesus. So whether they're not a follower of Jesus or they're searching and something's going on in their life that, that warrants some care and some love, the first impression caused the church to lose the opportunity to bring them into the family. Now I'm so grateful today that this is not a picture of Sioux Falls First. I'm so grateful for the many people that passionately serve every week, that give of their time, that do it with a smile, that have great people skills and the way that they interact with people and make people feel like that they're glad to be here. I'm grateful for that. But I will tell you that we are in a season where uh, many people are starting to come back, and I'm prophetically saying out of COVID, right? They're coming here out of COVID, the COVID cave, right? People are maybe coming for the first time because somebody invited them and they're living their lives right now in fear and worry and anxiety and wonder of what's gonna happen in this world and, and they're in a volatile state in their life. So, so those invitations to, to come and be part of our church or, or, or come and sit by me, we've, we've talked about Jesus, but come and join me in on, a, on a Sunday. People are coming that way. There are people that literally have connected with us online um, through this, this season, and, and, and they've been watching, and, and we know that um, online is not going away. In fact, online campus is now literally the front door of the church. It's the foyer of the church where people experience the first impression, even through online. And so we have people that have joined us online that are actually joining us in person now to tell you that I, I know it's Labor Day weekend, and it doesn't feel that way, but there's a whole lot of people coming back. And man, I'm grateful for that. I'm excited about that. But man, when I think about my experience that I had a few times throughout my life in, in the restaurant where I got so frustrated, I couldn't wait to get out. I say, God, help us be ready as a church for the people you're sending. Help us be ready. In fact, I, I thought about this. You know, um, you would never invite someone to your home without being ready. You know what you do? You, um, you actually get the best meat out of the freezer, make sure it's thawed, you, you plan this elaborate, extensive, amazing meal, some of the best stuff you cook. Man, you make sure you get the vacuum out. You don't just vacuum like, like sometimes we vacuum. You actually get under the couch and in the corners. And, and man, you buy these candles that just smell really good. And, and, and you dim the lighting. And then you are ready for your, for your guests to come. You wouldn't have them come to the door. They open the door and say, oh, uh, um, yeah, come on in. Uh, what do you want to eat today? Hey, I, I don't have any clean dishes in my house right now. So would you go ahead and, dishwasher's broke, would you go ahead and just clean those dishes and I'll start getting the meal ready? And I mean, you wouldn't even think of that. 
You, you wouldn't even think of doing that. And yet, sometimes I think in the church, we, we kind of go, take a secondary approach and think, hey, they'll just figure it out. And I believe God is calling us as a church, when we talk about a heart for the house, that we have a heart to serve passionately because we understand that God is sending the people that we've invested in, God is sending the people we've invited, and we wanna make sure that when they walk into God's house, that we are ready to serve them, that we are here for them when they come. Amen? Amen. It's the heart of hospitality. It's the heart for the house. And as we close out our series today, we are literally looking at the blueprint of our culture, which is to connect relationally. We are a relationship church. We believe that the kingdom of God is access to relationship. God could have sent a plan, but he sent a person. God, God could have done anything to bring salvation to us, but he sent his only son to die on a cross to, to in, incarnationally come and relate with us before he even died on the cross. We, we connect relationally. We grow spiritually. Pastor Charlie knocked it out of the park last week talking about how God's called us as a, as a church body to come together in LC groups and, and be our iron that sharpens iron and literally grow spiritually together. That God's not called you to be a Lone Ranger Christian. God's not called you to do it by yourself, so we, we grow spiritually together. But then also to serve passionately. And we've used the first century church as the example of what that looks like. In fact, their values encapsulate who God has called us to be. When we think about sometimes drifting from what the church is really supposed to be, I believe like anything else, we go back to the prototype. We go back to the model, and the very model is given to us in the book of Acts as the church of Jesus Christ was born and, and begin, to, begin to grow and begin to advance the kingdom of God. We can find many, many principles. We can find many characteristics that are important for us to embrace as a church. And in those, we see these three things that are a blueprint of our culture. The last couple of weeks, We've read, that, we've read Acts 2, but this morning, I want us to look a little beyond Acts 2. We're actually going to read in Acts chapter 6 because you remember that when Peter preached, it was the same guy that was fearful of the girl asking Peter if he was associated with Jesus, and he said, man, I don't even know the man. And then we know after the Holy Spirit came upon him, there was, was a boldness that captured his heart. And he stands up and preaches this not-so-PC message to people that literally um, could have killed him for preaching it. And he, he preaches the gospel. 3,000 people get saved, give their hearts to Jesus Christ. And then literally they realize that now we have been recipients of the rescue mission, that now we become participants in rescuing people. And so immediately they begin to share their story, they begin to share the word of God, they begin to testify, and like wildfire, the gospel began to go forth and the church began to grow. And so as the church grew and, and the leadership pool was narrow, there were some changes that had to be made. And I want you to read in Acts chapter six what happens pretty shortly after the church really started exploding. It says in verse one, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the 12 gathered all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. So brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and we'll give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. So a couple of things they're saying there. They're saying the apostles can't do it all, right? They're admitting we can't take care of everything that is happening right now with these people being saved and getting them discipled and, and making sure they're staying connected, all these things. We can't do it all. So then we see this principle of delegation. They said, we're gonna hand some responsibilities off to other people so that we can do what we're supposed to do. 
And, and we read on, it says in, in verse 5, this proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, Philip, Procurus, and Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. Verse 7, so the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So in the midst of this amazing revival and growth, the ministry expectations exceeded the ability of the apostles to meet those needs. And so they said, hey, we're gonna choose seven deacons. We're gonna gather together seven deacons who can be leaders, who will also lead leaders, who will build people up and teach people how to serve where we can make sure that ministry is happening, make sure that things are being taken care of, and we can give our time to prayer in the ministry of the word because it's only the preaching of the word that literally transforms people's hearts. And, and so this is exactly what happens in, in this passage. The Greek word for deacon is diakonos which means servant. So I'll tell you the primary characteristic of true leadership is servanthood. And I am so grateful for the men and the women in our church, even not just in this current time, but in even previous years, who've served as diakonos, deacons, in this tremendous role. They have been a tremendous blessing to me and to our staff and to our church and to our community. And I'm grateful for them because we absolutely need them to do ministry. But I don't want you to look at this text just through the lens of, of, of the role of deacon. Because I believe there's a principle being expressed in the word of God that is happening in a, a season of growth, in a season of expansion, to help us understand what is necessary for us to always stay ahead, for us always to make sure that we're ready for the next person that comes. Because you know what? The next person that comes may be your son. The next person that comes may be your daughter or your neighbor or your coworker, and, and, and I want you to personalize that and say, what would it be like if they showed up? How, how, can I, how can I make sure that I'm participating enough for them to be ready? How are we as a house making sure that the candles are lit and the lights are dim and the dinner's ready, the table is set, and when they come and, 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 and join us, they feel like they are at home because we tell them, feel at home. I want you to feel at home. And man, our prayer is that when people come to the doors of this building, that literally they, they come as friends, but they leave as family. That when they come in, that they realize, man, they, 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 they matter. They realize that people care for them, that people are waiting for them to come. There's a sense of expectation that, you know what, they, they were expecting me to come. I wasn't a second thought. And so we, we see that in here, and, and I, I, uh, I think of the, the principle is expansion through empowerment. Like the only way that we can expand, the only way that we can extend our family is that when we are willing to empower people to serve, to take their place, to do what God has called them to do. And we know the very thing that restricts the vision of God over a church or over a city is the lack of people that are willing to serve. That's why Jesus says, hey, listen, this harvest is ready, but would you pray for laborers? Would you pray for workers? Would you pray for servants who would see things the way I see them? Who would see people the way I see them, that every person matters? And we wanna do everything we can to make sure they know that when they walk through the doors of the building, when they've been invited, when somebody has invested their lives in them, and finally they take the relational risk of coming to a church. And I pray that we would respond to the relational risk, not just with information, but I pray that we would respond with relationship. I pray that we would respond with care. And this was happening, but, but I, want you to, I want you to think about this, not... Not, not just in this moment, but I want you to think back to what was happening in the book of Acts. And these people were coming to Christ and they were bringing their friends, they were bringing their family members. Households were being saved. Growth was happening. What if the apostles would have had to do it all? How would the trajectory of the early church been different if they wouldn't have 
laid their hands on and prayed for seven deacons. And even this idea that the deacons just didn't serve, but they raised up other people to serve as well. Who would have missed the opportunity to experience the life-changing message of the resurrected Christ? Here's what I'll tell you. The shortage of servants would have placed limitations on the early church, even though they were still full of the power of the Spirit. The Spirit doesn't occupy buildings. The Spirit occupies people. The Spirit comes into people for a purpose. Not only to be the habitation of God in us, but also to be the the response mechanism to a broken world, a world that needs to hear about who Jesus is, a world that needs a different portrait that's been portrayed to them from whatever place. In fact, even recently there's been news that have come across the feed that is disturbing to me because this is a church supposed to be leading the way. The world is watching. They're not peeking, their eyes are wide open. And I pray that in every way, I know it's not perfection, I understand it's not perfection, but I understand it is a posture of heart to help us represent Jesus to the people that we are telling him about. The people that see us and interact with us, the people that intersect our lives, even people that walk through the doors of a building. You see, but because the people of God embraced the heart for the house, even in the early church, which is a heart to serve the word of God spread and the number of disciples increased rapidly. Tremendous growth. They were able to steward this move of God. They were able to handle this revival because they were ready. They said, Lord, here I am, send me. Lord, I pray that you would use me. God, I'm not going to be a consumer. I'm going to be a contributor. God, I'm stepping up for you to use me in any way that you can. It's not doing it all, but it's doing something. In fact, if we want to see the kingdom of God increase in our city, we have to be willing to serve passionately. That's how Jesus served. In fact, Jesus, we see this this picture in Mark chapter 10, 42 through 45, where it says, Jesus called them together. And he said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Jesus, the one that we claim to follow, set the example by making servanthood his purpose. Now, I understand that servanthood is not just something that happens during one of the services on Sunday morning for you and I. That servanthood is meant to be an attitude, an expression of who we are in God's kingdom to people all through the week. That God has called us to live our lives as servants. How can I serve? How can I, how can I help? How can I make life better again? I know I can't do everything. I know there's only so much capacity, but it's not an excuse for us to do nothing. For us to not say, no, I, I, wanna, I wanna be used of God. I want God to use me. In fact, I wanna just share with you qu- quickly two truths that I believe will give you a clear perspective of what serving passionately is all about. Number one is that people are the aim. In fact, the needs that surfaced in the early church due to everybody coming in and getting saved and bringing their friends, the the needs that surfaced in the season of growth in the first century church with the widows and others represented individual people. I think for years in America, the church has been focused on the, the, the numbers and they're counting the numbers, we're not, not counting the people. And we talk about how every number has a name, every name has a story, every story matters to God. And I believe God has called us to see and serve people, individuals. Now, I know you can't serve everybody. God's not called you to take the responsibility of the entire house or even the entire community. But God has called you to say, if he's called you to and he's gifted you to do your part, to step in and take your place, to say, I wanna participate in this expression of the kingdom of God to earth and, and serving other people. It's our aim, it's our directive. 
It's why God's got you here. It's why you're breathing. It's why God has given us health. It's not for us just to enjoy our life and enjoy 75, 80, 90, 100 years and, and, and cash out, but God has called us to expend our lives for him. Why? Because servanthood opens the hearts of people to the work of God. In fact, we've shared many times that you can see throughout Scripture where, where there was a moment of hospitality, there's a moment of serving, there was a time where they set the table and made things ready, and it literally preceded the miraculous. And, and I believe that God not only wants to do miracles in the marketplace and all through the week in your job and in your family and in your neighborhood, come on somebody, we need miracles to come forth today in Jesus' name. But I believe when we gather together as the people of God, there are people that God is sending here to this hospital, this trauma center, who need an absolute miracle. They need a miracle in their marriage. They need a miracle in their finances. They need a miracle in their body. And they're walking in. And I pray that we are willing to be the vessel that God uses to distribute his power and his grace and his glory and his miracle through us to meet those needs and to minister to those people. Amen? Because hospitality sets the table. We did a series called A Seat at the Table, and I think we understand very clearly as a church that everyone is welcome here, that anybody we reach out to and invite, we're gonna make sure that they feel like they have a seat around the table. They're not, they don't have a seat in the corner. They're not in a different room, but we understand God has called us to bring them in and give them a seat around the table, but, but it's, it would be a shame if we asked them to take a seat at the table and we've not even prepared the table. The table's not ready. There's no meal there. Again, they, they feel like they're an intruder. And, and I believe that as we serve, as we express hospitality, that there's something that happens in people's hearts. Serving is a way that we make an eternal difference in people's lives. It's no insignificant thing. And, and I wanna remind you this, that God didn't bring you out of the depths of sin to take a seat. As a spectator, that God reached into the deepest pit. It doesn't matter who you are or where you came from. All of us had our sin. All of us had our junk. We were all sinners. We, we, we are saved by grace, right? But he brings us out and, and he literally, we, 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 become, we are the objects of the rescue mission. But as soon as we are saved, we become emissaries of that same mission with the gifts and the abilities and the personalities that God has placed in us to do everything we can. Even as Paul said, I become all things to all men that I might win some, that I do everything I can to serve and use my life to bring people to Jesus, to bring people into the kingdom, to bring people into, into his house, into a family. In fact, 1 Peter 4, 10, 11 says, each of you should use whatever gift you received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do it as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do, it, do so with the strength that God provides so that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever, amen. And that leads to the second truth. And that is that God is the focus. So people are the aim. That's a direction, that's a directive. God is the focus. The focus is the center of the target. That even though people are the aim, God is the audience. In fact, you can read in Colossians chapter three, verse 23 and 24, that whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord and not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. So listen, I know serving is not always convenient. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. Sometimes we want to break out of, you know, we, we've worked hard through the week and we've done this and we've done that. And, and sometimes we just want to take the break. But listen, serving is what honors God. Serving is an aspect of our worship. We're doing it for his glory. In fact, this principle applies to all Christians, understanding that I'm not serving for people's sake because my reward doesn't come from them. That, that what I'm doing on this earth towards people with, with the directive God has given me is what's allowing me to be the recipient of rewards in heaven. I'm, not, I'm probably not gonna see them here. 
A lot of those rewards you're, you're building up for eternity, not for earth. So again, you, you, you have to learn that we're not going to live for the accolades of men or the applause of men, the praise of men. But what we do to serve people is understanding it is part of my worship. And even as you go into your prayer closet and close the door, nobody may know about it. There are a lot of things that you're going to do that nobody may know or notice. Nobody may even say anything to you about, but God does notice. And God sees it as, as an aspect of your worship, that what you're doing, you're doing it as unto the Lord. In fact, Ephesians 6, 7, and 8 says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people, because you know that the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. In fact, both passages that we shared say that we should serve God wholeheartedly, which literally means with the soul. We know the soul is the, the mind, the will, the emotions, everything we have. He's saying, serve wholeheartedly. Serve passionately. Serve with enthusiasm. Enthusiasmos means God within. So my expression of enthusiasm is reflecting who lives inside of me. That it's God within me. That, I man, how, how, how can you greet with such a smile? How can you reach out and take a person down to the other end of the building, uh, to kids' church with such a smile? Why are you so excited about it? It's because God is living in me. And because I know what he's done, and I counted the cost of what he's done for me, that I'm willing to step in to his cause, to his kingdom, and do for others what others did for me. Listen. Most likely, you are here today. Maybe you're even connecting with us online because of a relationship. Now, it may be the relationship of your parents that drug you here. But most likely, it's just a significant relationship. It could be a family member, a husband, wife, a boyfriend, girlfriend, an uncle, an aunt, a grandma, a grandpa, a neighbor, a coworker. And, and there's a reason, and there's, there's a reason you responded to them and you're here. And I thank God there's so many people. In fact, it's been amazing to me when I'll just begin the conversation with somebody I don't know. It'll be a waiter, it'll be a person at, at Walmart checking me out, and I'll say, I'll start talking to them. And then, and then eventually, you know, because it's short, short term, long term, you can, you can extend the conversation, but it's a short term conversation. But I'll say something, hey, you go to church anywhere? Oh, no, I'm getting, you know, I'm looking, I, whatever, whatever. I say, hey, I would love for you to come and, 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 and be with me and see what's sit with me. I would love for you to come. Kind of measuring where the Holy Spirit's working and how he's doing it. And then maybe the Lord allowed me to see him again the next week and I can continue the conversation. But I've been surprised, I've been absolutely amazed at the hostility that you see on media. It sometimes creates a false image of how people are. And what I've learned is that people are very receptive. People are hungry. People are fearful. They're worried. People are walking through things. That most people are just waiting for you to invite them into the process, to bring them to church, to maybe sit down for a cup of coffee and talk to them about life. People are ready. So how can I serve? How can I even serve the lost? Right? You know, the, the distortion people have in their minds can be broken by us just being the church. By us just stepping up and doing what God has called us to do, we can literally destroy the image they have that is so negative towards the church. Just by being, being like Jesus. Right? You read through the pages, man, I can't believe Jesus did. Yeah, Jesus went and ate with sinners. And just be like Jesus. Serve them. He served them. He didn't say, hey, I just want to gather all the, the, the Christians, the committed, and I'm going to serve you. He served everybody. He didn't come with any bias. He didn't come with any prejudice. He said, I, I'm going to serve people because understanding the mission is to draw them into the kingdom of God, draw them into the family. And so I just want to say thank you to the Dream Team members in this church who are saying, you know what, I'm, I'm all in. Pastor Quentin, I understand. I understand that to have a heart for the house, 
that I need to have a heart to serve passionately. But there's people that are coming. Listen, I believe we're coming into a season before the Lord returns where there's going to be a mighty, mighty, powerful harvest. But it's not going to happen unless we are ready. It's not something that just drops from the sky. It's something God is looking to his church to be prayed up, ready to go, to be ready to do what God's called them to do. To say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. Use me. Use me, God. And I want to thank all the men. I'm, I'm so thankful for the, the many that serve in tech and cafe and ushers and greeters and kids ministry and youth ministry and prayer ministry and all these ministries that that literally help us to portray Jesus like he wants to be portrayed to a world that needs him. So as we close today, I think about that restaurant experience. And to be honest with you, I'll just be straight with you. I never wanna be that church. In fact, I don't want any church in this city that's preaching the Bible to be that church that I'm not just rooting you on, I'm, I'm rooting them on from a distance today, saying, God, I pray that you would help them. Because I've talked to many friends who said, you know what, people are, starting to coming back, start, people are starting to come back, but people aren't jumping into serving. And so, dude, I'm, I'm scratching my heads and I'm trying to encourage pastors. Say, just hold on and preach the mission. Remind people why they're here. Remind people why God has called them out as the ecclesia, as, as the church called him out of darkness and into his light to reflect him. And so today as we close, obviously, again, people are coming. People are coming back. People are coming for the first time. And I truly believe we have not even seen a fragment of what God wants to do in and through this church. What God wants to do in the church in this city and so we have to be ready for what he wants to do. And so I'm gonna ask you to take your phone today. And there's some of you, many of you that are already serving faithfully and, and you feel like you're at capacity. And I just wanna say again, thank you. I wanna say thank you. And this obviously, hopefully was more of an encouragement to you rather than a challenge, because you're doing it. But I want you to get your phone out. And, and, and part of our response today is we have many areas. In fact, there's a lot of areas to serve. And you can find many of those areas on our website. But today we're just focusing on five and then we're gonna put other. So you can do other, so six. If you take out your phone and you would text serve, just the word serve, to our landline as a church, to 605-361-6300. You, you text the word serve. Six areas, or, uh, six areas of opportunity will be prompted to you. It'll be kids. Man, we, God's doing some amazing things in our kids' ministry. Amazing things. And it would be, it would be an amazing honor to be part of such a life-changing ministry in our church that's transforming the next generation, partnering with parents to lead life change in their family. And so kids, there's different areas of kids to serve. Ushers. Ushers who are welcoming people into the sanctuary, who are making sure needs are met, who are serving, as you'll see in a few moments. Next steps. So every week, it's, we say, hey, you go back to the next steps here and get a gift, and if you have any questions, you can ask if, man, we're just here, and again, it's that, as they leave, it's not only first impression, but as they leave, it's the last impression. It's not just about the gift, but it's about somebody saying, hey, we're so glad you came today. You have any questions? Any way I can help you? And dude, we send people back there, we wanna make sure they're there, right? I don't wanna, I, I never wanna be guilty of false advertisement, right? So next steps, cafe. Man, dude, a lot of, a lot of lives being changed in Cafe 1010. Tech, all kinds of tech, sound, media, computer, cameras, or other. You may say none of these fit, but I, I, wanna, I wanna find a place to serve. If it just in this moment, if, if you're coming back into serving or maybe you're, man, this is my church and man, I, I wanna serve. I wanna do something for, for God. I want God to use me here. I wanna join with my brothers and sisters across this church, across three services and do my part to serve. Would you go ahead and even do that now? And then you'll get a, it'll prompt our ministry leader and over the next couple weeks, they'll be able to reach out to you. Reach out to you. 
and, uh, and plug you in. Make sure that you have what you need to step into serving. And we just want to say ahead of time, thank you. Thank you. We had great response in first service. I'm anticipating great response today. We want to say thank you. So as we close today, um, we, we serve open communion at Sioux Falls First, which means if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what church you come from or if you're a member here, that's, that's not important for us to be able to participate in communion today. So if you, ha- if you don't have one of these communion packages, would you just raise your hand and our ushers will make sure that you get one. Just raise your hand and keep it raised so they can see it. And they're gonna serve you amazing ushers that are serving every week. And uh, they're gonna make sure you have what you need. Just keep your hands raised. And as they're handing that out, I wanna remind you of Luke 22. Jesus is sitting down and having his last supper with his disciples. It's a key moment. It's kind of one of those parting shots where they're gathering together. He's saying, hey, keep your hand lifted. He's saying, um, you know, I'm taking this last supper. I won't participate again until the kingdom. And, um, and so Jesus serves them. It wasn't buffet style. It wasn't, hey, I'm leaving a box of cereal out on the, on the shelf and you help yourself. Jesus served them. He took the bread and he broke it. He blessed it, gave it. He took that cup, he took that wine, and he handed it out to them. He served them. And I think it was intentional. I think it was a perfect picture to remind them of when they leave this place. For their entire life, God's called them to live as servants of the Most High God. But then, at the end of the conversation, some of the disciples started, uh, pride started setting in on some of them. And they're talking about who's going to be the greatest. Who who gets to sit next to Jesus next time? Hey, who's who's his favorite? And they're kind of like posturing. (laughs) And Jesus corrected them and say, hey, the greatest among you will be the greatest servant. What is he saying? In the kingdom of God, the way up is down. The way down is up. It's countercultural but it really does demonstrate what Jesus did and who he is and how that's to be who we are. So church, would you stand across this place and we're just gonna thank the Lord because he rescued us, he saved us, he brought us out of sin, he gave us a seat at the table, he gave us a calling, he gave us a responsibility. And so again, if you take the, the wafer side on top, you can tear that off. And then when we're done in a few moments eating the, the bread, you can turn it over and and then open and, and drink, the, drink the juice, the cup. But let's pray. Father, I thank you today. God, whether we're in here in this building or we're watching online, I thank you for, Lord, what you did for us, what you accomplished for us through the cross of Jesus Christ. I thank you that all of our sin was placed upon you, that you were beaten for our transgression. You bled for our iniquities, God. The Lord, the chastisement of our peace, for our peace, was upon you. And by your stripes we're healed. And Father God, as we get ready to partake of communion, this amazing, not just ceremony, but act of obedience, that if there's people that need to be healed today, that they would receive your healing, physical healing, spiritual healing, healing from trauma, healing from past events, healing from things that may have happened to them when they were children, Father God, we declare your healing over relationships. We declare your healing, God, over every aspect of who we are because when you brought salvation, Lord, the word is sozo, which means body, soul, and spirit, every aspect of our lives receives healing because of you. And we thank you that it's by your stripes. God, we're also grateful for the blood of Jesus that still flows for lost family and friends and coworkers and people in our city and people in our nation. And as crazy as our world is right now, we know that the answer is in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, God. And I pray that we'd once again be motivated to reach more people for Jesus. Lord, we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, let's receive the bread together. Let's receive the cup.